welcome to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm so excited that you're joining us today. We are going to have a fascinating conversation, as usual, as we learn from people all around the world at all ages and stages of life. Stay tuned as we shift our dementia care from crisis to comfort. Here we go. What you think about Well, welcome back to Alzheimer Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm thrilled that you are joining us today. We are going to have a really interesting conversation about protecting your assets. You know, there really is nothing more important that we can do, not only for ourselves, but for our family to reduce stress. But before I introduce our guest today, I always like to do a few shout outs. So for those that are new, Alzheimer Speaks is about sound information, not just sound bites. We like to have real conversations with real people. And uh, we interview people all over the world from those living with dementia to family and friends to professionals, advocates, researchers, you name it, everyone is welcome. I do want to just do a reminder that tonight, Art of Senior Living is sponsoring a program that I'll be providing called Tools for Dementia Professionals, Understanding and Supporting the Families that We Serve. And you can register with them by calling 240-293-0200. Four, four. That's 240-293-0244. And for those of you looking for support groups, I do do a couple of them a month. Arthur's Senior Care sponsors Arthur's Memory Cafe, which was actually uh, one of the first memory cafes here in the U.S. And we meet the second and the fourth Wednesday of each month at 1 p.m. Central Time. We're doing that virtually, so any of you can attend. And then also on the last Wednesday of each month at 10 a.m. Central Time, Brookdale North Oaks and the Shoreview Community Center sponsor a program for caregivers only. And uh, you're more than welcome to register for that. You can call 763-913-6140. Now, I don't know if we're gonna meet in person. Last month was the first time we met virtually. We're just going to have to wait and see how the virus is playing out. Um, But again, for both of those, you can also reach out to me at radio at alzheimerspeaks.com. Of course, I want to mention Dementia Map. Dementia Map is a resource directory. It has events. It's got a glossary, a blog. Um, It is free to use for anyone. Uh, We have about 150 categories there you can mine uh, information for, and we are growing every day. If you have a business service product or tool you'd like listed in there, again, just reach out to me. I'd be more than glad to give you a tour. Let's see, two more to go. Picnic Health is a new research project for Alzheimer's. And uh, by signing up for it, you can actually get $25. And what they do is they collect and digitize all of your medical records into one online account. And then you can authorize them to share anonymized data of your records with medical researchers. And by examining this real world data from your medical records, researchers can find answers that they wouldn't have found in clinical trials. So know that your health uh, care journey is important in terms of of research and what can be done moving forward. Also, if you are responsible for a person uh, living with Alzheimer's, you can sign up on their behalf as well, as long as you've got legal ability to do that. And um, Picnic Health will would love that data as well. You can go to picnichealth.com forward slash speaks and get that $25 when you sign up. One more thing that just came in my email box yesterday, which I, I love this. Libraries, you know, are going dementia friendly, many of them. And there's an opportunity where people can apply for um, two $2,500 grants for libraries that are either beginning or expanding their services to their to their patrons living with dementia. And just reach out to me, that'll be the easiest. Uh, radio at alzheimerspeaks.com. 
We're going to hear from the Foot Bar Walker, and then we'll be right back. I'm Peggy from Danville, Kentucky, and I'm 91 years old. The Foot Bar Walker revolutionized my care of George. It absolutely benefits the patient and the caregiver both, and that's the beauty of it. It's so easy to use. It folds up just like a dream. I got it in and out of the car without any effort at all. The saving that I made from having to put him in a nursing home came to about $192,000. The Foot Bar Walker was designed not only to assist the patient, but also the caregiver. It's like having a portable pull bar everywhere you go. Patients have more control of their motion and pain management, and no lifting from the caregiver is required. Caregivers, put your foot down and quit hurting your own health. No matter which side of the foot bar walker you're on, it's a win-win. Call 731-924-4444 and visit our factory showroom in Paris, Tennessee, or visit us online at thefootbarwalker.com. Okay, so it's time to introduce our guest today. Margaret Barrett is the owner and attorney of Safe Harbor Estate Law in St. Paul, Minnesota, and her personal experiences have fueled her passion in terms of helping her clients protect what matters most with real estate planning, estate administration, and asset uh, protection and planning. Well, as promised, um, we have a very exciting guest today who is so knowledgeable about asset planning and protection. Margaret, I am just so thrilled to have you with us today. Um, you know, I've seen you in action doing um, educational programs and, you know, your compassion and understanding for the law and, and really setting people up to succeed is, is so wonderful. So thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you, Lori. It's just an honor to be here. And I, I just, I don't think lawyers get called exciting guests very often. So that kind of makes my day. <laughs> I think this topic is so critically important. And I think sometimes where lawyers and kind of the average Joe out there get lost is, is some lawyers talk over our heads. And you make things really simple for us to understand why it's important and why it's structured the way it is. And so I, I just think this is really near and dear to my heart. I think it's just very, very important. You know, I was in real estate for 25 years before I stepped into this and I saw so many families struggle because there wasn't planning or they self-planned and it was like, oh, that didn't work the way we thought it was going to <laughs> type deal. And it just caused a lot, a lot of problems and stress that can really be alleviated when you go to an elder law attorney or an attorney that you knows specific in estate planning. So thank you so much for You're doing welcome. that. You're welcome. I think that's really true. And elder law attorneys haven't been along, around that long. When I was in law school, there was no elder law class even. And so people don't really know what we do. And so that's why I appreciate being on here because getting the word out and educating people is one of my favorite things. It yeah. can take stress off if you are more empowered. Oh, it really can. And, you know, we're, we're a society where we want to be in control. So why would we not want to be in control of end of life and, you know, how we want things to play forward? I, I think it's ridiculous that we don't have these conversations. We all know we're not getting out of here alive. So why do we pretend any differently? This shouldn't be a scary thing. This should be, you know, for me, when I go through, you know, my, my will and, and um, healthcare directives and stuff like that, it makes me feel calm for my family going, okay, I, I'm doing this not only for myself, but for them, because I've been in the shoes of, you know, having parents um, who have passed away. And, you know, is, is many people is you can have a lot of people die in your life, but if you're not the one <laughs> that has to take care of everything that brings it to a whole nother level. And you really understand the importance of this process and what it can mean uh, to your family and friends who, who are left dealing with things. So before we kind of get into, you know, the crosshairs of things, I always like to ask all my guests if they have been personally touched by dementia in your own family or circle of friends. I actually have, Lori. My dad passed away from Alzheimer's in January 2019, thankfully before COVID. Um, and so he was sick with it for a number of years. And the last two years in the nursing home side of the facility where my mom lived still. And um, so 
that was a hard road and we supported her and him and I have uh, seven siblings. We work together well, which is good. Um, and now my mom, who's 89, she'll be 90 in May. I mean, March 10th, happy birthday, mom. Um, she was, we recently told that her cognitive impairment is starting a little bit and she may be developing dementia. And I told at the doctor's office, I'm like, well, I thought she had, she was 89. She didn't get dementia. She'll be good. And they said, no, actually, the older you get, the more likely that you will get it. So we're facing the prospect for her. And COVID's not kind to cognitive decline. You know, it, it really elevates things. And I, I know we, we did shows on that. And it was interesting because all providers said, everything's going well, everyone's doing really well. And about the two and a half to three month mark, everybody started knowing, noticing differences. And I don't know if that's really when the cognitive decline started or if that's when they were calmed down enough to be able to see what was happening with their clients because there was, I mean, it was just crazy times with the PPE and, and things, so. Yeah. You're right. It, it, COVID and, and all the aftermath and other things happening in society since then have affected people with diminished capacity. And, and all of us really can see it in, you know, counselors are busy and drug use and alcohol use is up and, and so many things are affected. And we see it in our clients. We have more crisis situations. Like one that I told you when I got on the call, I was just dealing with a crisis emergency guardianship. Um, and um, there definitely are more of them. Things are more difficult for people. It's a hard time. All the more that if you get your planning done ahead of time, you can avoid it. Yeah, it, it is even more important now. I agree. Well, let's let's talk about your your company, Safe Harbor um, Estate Law. Why don't you tell people where you're located and uh, what made you decide to get into being an attorney? We should probably start there. Well, I've been an attorney since 1991, <laughs> so I was 12, you know, <laughs> but um, <laughs> not really. Um, and I did a number of different things. In um, I worked for a big law firm, and I worked for a medical device company, and then I worked for my church, a women's ministry, and I always said, then I got to use the other side of my brain, so I'm not just analytical, but I can work with people. And um, so when I went back to practicing law, was eight years ago now, I decided to go into estate planning and elder law. Because first of all, you know, everybody my age, like we're, first we're worried about our parents and then we're thinking we're not far behind. And so it's relevant. And I really like that you're, you're, it both has that, you know, legal analysis part and, and lobbying for your client, but it also has the care and the counseling and the coming alongside. And so it's a really nice balance for me. And um, so, and I did want to just do estate planning that's where you plan for when you die. And then a lot of those attorneys also will handle estates after someone dies, which we do. Um, but I wanted to do elder law because not a lot of attorneys do it. And, you know, the, you know right, the baby boom is aging and there's just more and more of us that are going to need these services. So um, I just find that we really impact people's lives, whether we're being proactive and preventing problems, which is super rewarding, or we are coming alongside people in a sad time when someone died or kind of a crisis even. And um, so it's, we see fruit, you know, every day from what we do. And so that's really rewarding. Yeah. Well, and elder law attorneys are definitely different. Again, I'll go back to my real estate days. Yeah, I remember um, families coming in saying, you know, well, well, we have a life estate, you know, and and then all of a sudden that life estate has, to, for whatever reason, is coming apart. And then they're like, well, what do you mean I have to pay taxes on this? I wasn't told that because mm -hmm. no one no one talked about the other side of the what ifs. And that's what I like about elder law. You guys see all the different variety of things that can happen. You're, yeah, you're right. We're thinking about taxes and after people die and what will happen to the spouse and the kids. And right there, there's a lot of dynamics that go into it. So I always say people, if you're like over 50 and certainly over 60, if you're doing estate planning, I think it's good to work with an elder attorney or even if you have a estate planning you really like already, pull in an elder attorney because we sometimes have important input into the documents you have. And those laws are always changing. You know, it just, it, it seems like things are always spinning around and you need to know 
the most current, you know, data that you have to deal with, with those equations and all of that kind of stuff that goes way over my head. But, you know, you're sitting there with your calculator going, okay, well, this, and this, this, and this, and this, and you're like, okay, <laughs> you know, my other, my other attorney didn't, didn't do that with the calculator, but with elder law, I see that a lot. You're right. I mean, it's especially with medical assistance, which is in Minnesota, what we call what pays for long term care if you run out of money or if you protected some money and you, you, you follow their rules. There, it's not just laws, really, there's like rules and they change these numbers January 1st and July 1st because the new numbers just came out. I got a, a message like these are the new numbers. Okay. And then um, we work with the different counties and they interpret the rules differently. And, and it's like, and then it's like, They'll change stuff on us. Like, no, we're not doing that anymore. Now we're doing, oh, okay. And we have to go back to the rule book and see, well, is that within the rules? Well, I guess it is within the rules. They can change that on us. It, especially medical assistance more than anything, but uh, which is a big uh, part of elder law. Yes, it changes all the time. <laughs> yeah, and, and that you need somebody on top of that stuff. Well, let's start out. Let's go back a little bit younger and say, what happens to an individual? Because I think this is a huge oversight to an individual who's 18 years old with no estate plan in place. Because yeah. I, I think so many families think, well, they don't have anything. What do they need it for? Right, and they might not They might not need a will. Some should, some should even have a trust. But for sure, anybody over 18 needs, we call it empower the dream for over 18. Um, there's three documents. And this is for if they lose capacity, which means you can't handle your affairs. This could be temporary, like you got in an accident, you're sick, you know, you're COVID for a while or whatever. Uh, could be you're out of the country for a while. Could be permanent, sadly. Sometimes that happens. But a, the, a high percentage of us in our lifetime will be incapacitated. Sometimes. There's three documents that you need. Do you know what some of them are, Lori? I think you might know all of them. Well, the um, power of attorney, the health care directive, and, and then this new thing called digital assets. Um, right. Uh, those, those are the three that, that come to my mind. I wish I had a little word here to give you. Five stars. Ten stars. Oh. <laughs> that's good. So power of attorney is for finances. So that's to handle your finances and legal things. And then health care directive is for health care decisions. That's kind of self-explanatory. And so those two are really important if your loved one gets sick and we've had people hire us on an emergency basis, if this has been happening lately, you know, could be 64 years old, could be 23 years old, could be COVID, could be an accident. Oh, they're in the hospital. Can we try to get them to sign documents? It's a lot more expensive and hassle and stress. Can they sign them? If they can't sign them, they can't sign them. We have to go to court and get a guardianship conservatorship. That's what I was just working on before this meeting, an emergency guardianship conservatorship. And, um, you know, those are, they, they start at $5,000, I would say, and they go up from that. So I think it's a really cheap insurance to have the power of attorney and healthcare director to get your wishes that you want and to have the people you want handling your money and finances and, and your health and um, to not have a bunch of hassle or an expense and stress at the worst possible time. So a lot of times parents will pay for their youngster going off to college or whatever to get their plan in place and it can be a nice gift for them a great um graduation gift you know yeah. and, and people don't understand again i've had friends where this has happened and they're paying for their their son or daughter's health insurance they got in a car accident they can't get any information from the doctor you know, they, they have no power to do anything. And they're like, yeah. but it's my child. And it's like, but they're an adult. It's really terrible. So it, it, I, to me, it's great peace of mind and, and some of the cheapest insurance you can buy. It, I mean, considering the time and the money invested. And then I wanted to talk about the digital asset authorization, the third one. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people have a power of attorney health care directive. And by the way, you can find those forms online. We do see people a lot of times not filling them out correctly. And that can be a big problem. But anyway, um, they're more common and most people have heard of them. The digital asset authorization is pretty new. It was in, um, let's see, August 1st of 2018 that it was first created by law in Minnesota. It's called the RUFATA Act. It's like Uniform Digital Access Act. <laughs> um, and it kind of swept it across the country at the time. 
because what happened is you could be power of attorney for is it your your mom or dad? Well, my parents have both passed. They have both passed. Okay, so but, okay, so I'll use me. So my mom's still alive. So thankfully, so um, I could be power of attorney for her, and then um, but then of course she doesn't do much of this, but we do some banking online. Okay, so something happens to her, and then I may not be able to access for email where she gets bills or her accounts because I'm power of attorney, but I actually need digital access. So I'll tell you a story. It's even more important with younger people. There was a Jake Olson from Minnetonka and his parents, I think it was Bill and Christy. That, so this was around, um, well, before 2018, um, this happened. So he, Jake turned 18, they sent him off to the U of M. He completed his first semester successfully. There was an end of semester party, ugly Christmas sweater. So he went to that and he left about 11. Okay, tragically, they found him the next day down by the river. It was a very cold night. He froze to death. And his phone was nearby him on the ground. And they, they don't know what happened between like 11 and 2. They figured he froze, I think. And so, of course, besides being heartbroken and devastated, they really wanted to know what happened and they wanted access to, to the phone. Well, Apple was not giving access to the phone, even though they bought the phone. They paid for the phone, and it was dad's phone service. But he was 18, and they didn't have written permission. And at the time, there wasn't even an official form. <laughs> and so also the laptop, same story. And so at first, they wanted to figure out what happened. And after a while, too, they, they wanted his photos. You know, they want, you want the sentimental things, too. So they were a big part of pushing this Rufata Act through in Minnesota. And that, I think, is a good example of how important it can be. Now, sometimes, because it's a new document, you can still get in without it. But if you run up against it, I'm telling you, these big companies, you, you really don't have a chance because they are going to protect the, provide, the privacy of the person who died. From my investigation, that is a form I haven't been able to find online at all that it's talked about in great length. And reading it, my head just started spinning. You know, with with all of the variables from, you know, social media to banking to, you know, if you're a business, I mean, people, I mean, pretty much everybody has some type of either social media or online exposure, if we know it or not, you know, because most people have just even a cell phone, like you said, being able to get those pictures and messages or contacting people, you don't, might not know who friends are. That right. might want to know the status of somebody. You might not be able to collect all their assets because you're, it used to be you just check the mail for a month and you'd know everything going on with their finances, but you have to get in their email now. So yeah, there's a lot of things social. You, I mean, do you want to go on Facebook and post what the celebration of life is? You know, mm -hmm. there's, there's all kinds of emotional, physical, or uh, financial things why you might want it. We recommend it if you don't have that, if you power of attorney health care director, if you don't have that, you really need that. Mm -hmm. And all to me, all estate planning attorneys should have been doing this for a couple of years now. I'm so glad we brought that up because I, I think it's so important. Again, staging, an adult is an adult is an adult. And these are important papers and they shouldn't be overlooked. I mean, I wish they would teach this in schools because I, I think the kids would be okay with, with understanding why this is important, you know, to have in their life. And it's hard when... Your parents and a lot of people don't like talking about this. I, I mean, I'm thinking of my folks, for example. You know, my dad's like, ah, we don't have that much. We don't really need anything. And I'm like, you have more than what you, what you think. And these are needed things. Maybe not for you because you're gonna, you might be gone, you know, or incapacitated, yeah. and you really don't, you really don't care. But the rest of us still have to function and care for you at, at you know, the best way we can. And we can't do that without your permission and without knowing your wishes. Yeah. I, I would say most of our clients are not wealthy. The average people really need this. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's important. It saves money and it saves hassle. And so we're happy to do it. So, yeah, we always offer a little sale on this in the summer and are part of the dream package just so people can give it as gifts. My daughter turned 18 in August and she was in here shortly after, you know, with her dad and I. And she, um, you know, we did this kind of a rite of passage thing, like, wow, honey, you know, just kind of empowering her and helping her feel good and checking off the list of things you do before you go to school. So, of course, she had to because I'm her mom. But, <laughs> <laughs> but 
But we would like to see that become kind of a graduation tradition. Yeah. I, I like that. And so often people are lost at what do I what do I give? And what a great gift. Now, let's talk about the difference between wills and trusts, because I think there's a lot of confusion about that as well. So now we were talking about if you lose capacity before you die, and that's one estate planning important facet there. Now we're going to talk about when you pass away. That's what a will is for. You, you, you have to do it before you die. <laughs> and then you can't make any changes after. But And once you die, that's when it takes effect because the power of attorney health care directive, they're done. So in the will, you're going to point who's going to handle your affairs. It used to be called executor. Do you know what it's called now, Lauren? Because you're up to speed. I should know, but I- Personal I, representative. Okay. First, if, if, does that sound familiar? Yep. Yep. So a PR, we call it. But So the personal representative is the person in charge, and we always recommend naming one or two backups. Mm -hmm. Let's make these papers last a long time because we know that people tend to forget about them and not go back and update them. So that's what we like to do with for our clients. Name a couple people, and then you're going to say where you want your money to go. If you don't have a will, the, the state has a will for you. If there's a statute that will say how it goes. And most of our clients, they don't want it to go that way for one reason or another. So um, that's, that's basically what a will does. Now, there is a misconception that if you have a will, you don't have probate. That is not true. Sometimes you can get by without probate, but wills are actually designed to be probated. If you have a will, you're, you're going to get the people you want handling it, and the money will go where you want. But if you have to have a probate, then that's expensive, and there's delays, and it's public. That's what mm -hmm. people don't like about it. It costs more. You know, it costs at least $5,000 usually, and then it takes months, and then it, it's a lot of hoops to jump through. And it's public. Your information is public. You'll start getting solicitations and anybody can find out, you know, your information. So, like, generally how much money you have and who got it and stuff like that. So, it's not the end of the world. I mean, in, in California, probates are much more expensive than here. But here, it's still, it's still cheaper for almost everybody to do a trust instead of a will. Mm -hmm. So, that would be a living or revocable trust, you know, and... Um, that's a little different. So you create it before you die. It's like a basket. And then you put assets in the basket. And then the trust outlives you so it doesn't die. So there's no probate because the trust is the owner and the trust doesn't die. So one of the best things about a trust is it will avoid probate as long as we get the assets in there. So you want to work with an attorney who's really good at helping you get the assets in there because that's a common problem. And people are like, well, I got my trust, but then they don't get the assets. And I was like, car with no gas or whatever. it's not going to work. <laughs> so they avoid probate. They also work great. Trusts are great if you don't have capacity because they are more powerful and flexible than a power of attorney. Power of attorney is still important, but now we're getting to the higher level product and trusts are really good that way. They also are really good for like, if you're going to have if someone has special needs and you don't want all the money going to the government because they're on a government program. If you have somebody who is young or just maybe isn't good at hand, handling money or is going through chemical dependency or something, and you don't want to just give them whatever it is, $300,000, $100,000, $10,000, um, you want a trustee to dole it out to them to maybe help them learn how to handle finances if that's feasible. So um, those are just some of the pros and cons. What we do in our office is if you come in and do a, a it's complimentary, it's free, but, um, we call it a life and legacy session, and you explain to us these are my goals, these are what I'm worried about. Um, this is my. So we have to ask some personal questions. That's why we assure you it's confidential and it's all relevant. You know, like what are your assets like? Um, where do you want your money to go? How's your relationships with your family and your health? Then we can kind of in a detailed way go through. Here's the pros and cons of a will for you, and here's the pros and cons of a trust for you, and here's the cost, and here's the process. So you can be educated and empowered to decide what's right for you. There's a few people who are like, well, you, you know, your state's so big, you really need to trust. But your state's really small, you have a really good chance of avoiding probate, and we'll do everything we can to help you. Um, but most people, we present it to them and say these are the pros and cons, and they choose. And most of our clients do end up choosing a trust because the, it's kind of like if I pay a little more today, I'll pay less later. Mm -hmm. And my, my family will have less hassle later. A lot of people just do it because of the hassle, not the money. 
that was good. And I, I think it's um, important for people to understand. You know, one of the things that I think um, confuses people too is they say, well, I've got the power of attorney, but the power of attorney to my understanding is no good when somebody dies, but people still wave that around like, no, no, I'm okay. I can take care of this. No, I know you're, you're very right. And people will tell me all the time, like I was, I was talking to the bank and I told them my aunt died and all of a sudden the screen disappeared. I said, yeah, that's right. Cause your power of attorney is no good. <laughs> yep. So then it takes a while and we have to give them some paperwork to let the bank get me. It's, it's very disconcerting for people. Like I can't get out the money. I can't pay the bills. I'm worried about this and that. And, and, you know, I got no authority. Exactly. So the, so the best way to avoid probate would be to sit down and have a consultation and really figure yeah. out what is best for you. Cause there's not a one size fits all for, for everyone. You totally. Know? Totally the best to do that. Um, cause you, anyone, an attorney that you can connect with, who's going to take the time to answer your questions and to educate and empower you. That's what I think is important. You will find so much from me who will say, Oh, you know, everybody does well. Well, I'm not, they're not all like this, but there's some attorneys who want the probate system and they're okay with that, you know, and there's other attorneys who maybe push the trust a little bit too much, even though, like I said, for most people, it's probably better, but we just try to explain in that pressure. And sometimes we're surprised when people pick and that's okay. It's their choice. Just so long as we're comfortable, we explain things well, you know, we're safe harbor state law.com. And, you know, even on there, you can sign up for a session or call us and we have a really friendly staff. We get compliments on all the time that really care and take the time to listen and answer questions and, and steer you toward, you know, what you're comfortable with. Well, I have a question um, because I've heard this from, from many people too, like on a, a power of attorney or a, a will, you might want to have more than one person, kind of like a backup person. So you yeah. kind of have your primary and a backup. What if you don't have a backup person? I've heard more people say that. It's like, I'm not that close to my family or I don't necessarily trust my family or I don't, I mean, there's a lot of family dynamics and then friendships change. And what do people, I mean, is it safe to just have one person? Cause I mean, they could get hit by a bus too. Yes. Um, you're so right. I mean, and this is common. And then when people feel like they don't have their person with two backups, they feel kind of bad about it. And, um, and there's no need to feel bad. It is quite common. And I'll tell you when estate planning attorneys get together, a lot of us have the opinion, like there are, there are professionals you can appoint to do this. Yes, you pay them, but they're professionals. And we would love to see more people appoint professionals because a lot of times a family member gets appointed. It's just a burden. Like with, you know, they love the person, but there's so much going on in their life or they're just not good at finances or whatever. And they would really like to have someone else, but they feel it's their duty. So they do it. Um, and sometimes people fight, you know, and so I think it's really good to have a professional fiduciary be a backup. And so we have relationships with people that we've developed so we can recommend options and we give the contact information. So you feel free to contact them, check their website, talk to them, pick somebody you like, you know, if, for instance, if you're appointing a trustee for your minor kids, you know, do you really want your brother to do it? And then Thanksgiving will be uncomfortable because he won't let them have that convertible, you know, and maybe you want to have a trustee or co-trustee who's professional who can say no and preserve the relationship. So there's lots of reasons why we use professionals, you know, a fair amount and not always with people with a lot of money. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's worth it. Yeah. It can be well, worth it in the right situation. I remember going through the process with my folks and, um, I didn't know you at the time. And we, uh, we went to a, another attorney here who was an elder law attorney and she was so funny. And she says, okay, Lori, now get out of the room. And right. she's like, I got to talk Turkey with your folks about you and your brothers and your relationships and your spouses and your that, 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 that. And my folks were like, well, no, she can be with us. And she's like, no, she needs to go. Yeah. She's like, we, we really need to talk Turkey on how stable are the relationships? Does anybody gamble? Are there any addictions? How likely are they going to stay married? I mean, all these tough questions. And um, it ended up, I was able to stay in because my folks said she knows everything we want her in. And it was fascinating because it was questions I never would have thought would have been asked, but oh my gosh, how important they are for people to be honest about those things. And I think even now, you know, with divorce being so prevalent, or even with a, a lot of people not getting married anymore, but they have a significant other, it's like, well, do I put them in on that role? Are they, 
yeah. a permanent can, fixture. It can be more yeah. complicated. Yeah. Is yeah. something better, sometimes worse, but more complicated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because so, the system kind of set up for married people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it is it it is really important to have these conversations and to be honest. And if you're going to hire somebody to do that, now you had mentioned about you could hire a professional to kind of manage, um, a, a, let's say, a, a trust. Um, does that is that um, a monthly fee or does that kick in once you die and then all of a sudden it's active? So if I did it now, but everything was fine and I was in control. Right. Well, you don't have to pay them if they're not doing anything. Okay, because I'm and just thinking the, the, that's why that's one of the things um, you, you can talk to them about ahead of time is their fees. Mm -hmm. And some of them are, you know, a bigger outfit with 20, 40 employees and then different rates and they can delegate to the lowest level like we do here in my office. You know, we have different levels, which is nice because then it, we can be more efficient for the client. But, but sometimes solos are a great answer, too. So it really will depend on um, your kind of your estate what's going on with it mm -hmm. um, but you don't pay until they're okay uh, you know, I just thought that might be a question that people people it's, might have it's a really good question and some of them will require you to move the money there and some don't so that's another factor we look at and we just kind of educate people on that's a very good question okay mm -hmm. so let's move on to another one the nursing homes how how do I save my money so the nursing home doesn't get it? Um, do I have to spend down? I've heard all these stories from my friends who have dealt with their their family, mm -hmm. and no story is the same. You know, who do I trust for this? What do you say to yeah. what do you say to that? Wow, well, Lori, that's such a good question. We have so many people saying my neighbor said this and my brother said that, and it's like, well, where they get their law degree? Okay, so <laughs> but it's fine. I mean, it's good to talk amongst people and get ideas, but we hear a lot of misinformation, especially about the planning to pay for the nursing home thing and because things change, that's part of it. So yes, you do not have to spend everything on your care and then go in the nursing home. That's what medical systems want you to think. That's, that's the, the payer that pays for care when you run out of money. And if you're single in Minnesota, the general rule is you spend down to 3000, then you can go on medical systems. But there are some um, sophisticated, I would say, planning techniques that we employ and we work with people. And there is a five year look back. If you're going to apply for medical assistance, they're going to want to know kind of how you spent the money in the last five years. You know, did you make any gifts in the last 60 months? Those ran on the application. And if you made any gifts, they're going to pursue, well, you just did that to, to make us pay more and you pay less. So we're going to give you a penalty. Sometimes people come and hire us panicked about this penalty letter we got in there. And so, and we can help them, but we could help them more if they came beforehand, because instead of getting a penalty, or actually we can plan for penalties, I can give you, I can tell you an example of how we save people a bunch of money. Would that help? Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, so we do this frequently. We, we do planning for people often, and um, some of them get to do things like this. Um, so they might have, let's say, a single person, I'll make it easier, has um, $500,000 and they have a dementia diagnosis and they're starting to need care, but they're physically real healthy otherwise. And so, you know, you're looking at, I, I've heard dementia, like even 10 years of care sometimes. Have you, Lori? You know? well, my mom was in the nursing home um, 14 years. Okay, because I heard an average 10 and it seemed kind of long for me, but okay, so, you know, this is 10 times, you know, care could be easily can be hundred thousand dollars or more. Mm -hmm. That's a million dollars. I mean, most people don't have that. So this person is probably their five hundred thousand. They're going to run out of money. Okay. So we can either plan a pay down to three thousand and then go on medical assistance, or we do like this. If they're already needing care and we get them in a facility they like that takes medical assistance, and they have let's say two trusted kids they really like and are, are in uh, they're with it and everything. But then they can, let's say, give $300,000 to the two kids in an account, you know, not in the name of the parent. And then, um, and then we buy a special Medicaid compliant annuity. And, and sometimes, by the way, we'll put it in an irrevocable trust instead of an account. We can figure that out. But then we buy this new thing, relatively new Medicaid compliant annuity. And um, then we go on medical assistance. Like, so, you know, last month you had $500,000, Lori. This month your parent has only 
3,000. You know, how do we do that? Well, on the form it says, did you give any gifts in the last 60 months? Yeah, well, last week we gave Lori and her brother 300,000. And then they go, okay, there's a penalty for that. And they divide 300,000 by, I'll tell you about 8,700. And, and they'll do, oh, oh, they'll say 24 month penalty. And they're like, we're not paying a dime for 24 months to penalize you because you gave that money to your kids. Right? It, it's not really illegal. It's just that there's a penalty. But we bought the annuity and it's going to pay for 24. Like we calculated the, the, that we planned for it. Mm -hmm. And so the Medicaid compliant annuity, they're blind to it. They don't count it. It's like magic. The risk is what if your parent dies six months later, there's still a bunch of money in the annuity. It goes to the state. You don't get to keep it. Um, so that's an example. Of many people we can save half or more. Um, you can do things in a will. Like if there's if you're married, instead of giving everything to your spouse who's maybe got dementia or whatever, you if you have good kids again, you give half to your kids and only half to your spouse. Mm -hmm. And then um, that's you save half that way. And then the other half that's left, they could do the gift annuity and save 75%. There's also certain things you're allowed to spend on, like we'll tell people you should prepay your funeral before you go on medical assistance. Mm -hmm. Good thing to do anyway. Um, other examples, we'll look at what's your house like? Is it serving you? Do you need a new car? You know, we know what things they can spend on and the things that will get them in trouble. So we help you make the most of your money. And people can be really surprised. They're surprised they can do this. They're surprised how much money they save. And they're just so surprised that they didn't know. Yeah. Well, and I, I, a common question too is people say, oh, they put a lien on my house. Now I'm, you know, the, the well spouse is going to get kicked out of their house is the fear yeah. of yeah. that. What do you say to that? Very common situation. Even the person who is ill may want to stay in the house. Mm -hmm. And we help people with that a lot. And we, we actually help plan for both because you may not stay there forever, right? We're, we're constantly planning for different options. But um, it is true when someone's on medical assistance and owns a home, they put a lien on the home because they want to recover their money when the house is sold. Mm -hmm. But that, that doesn't keep, the other spouse can live there. You know, it's, it, the lien isn't effective until they die. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, there's actually kind of other trickier things you could do. Like the, the spouse could sell the house and buy another house. And, um, but anyway, I don't want to get too complicated. There's a concern about the lien. Um, and so um, we have to plan for that, but it will not keep someone from staying in the house. Yeah. Well, and I know in our family situation, they put a lien against my folks' house, and and I would laugh because every year they would <laughs> they would send out this thing of how long my mom was going to live to 131, and they would they would calculate you know the finances because she was going to live to 131, and I'm like, really actuators, these numbers are ridiculous, and I would get so upset. My attorney would always call me down and go, Lori, you're protected. It's going to be okay. And we did things right. And the lien just kind of melted away. It was there, it was in place, but you know, right. there weren't any loopholes for them to, for them to go after with the way things were done. What, what's new with the asset protection and Medicaid planning here in Minnesota? And I know it's different in all different States, but again, folks, this is why it's important to talk with an elder law attorney. It is. So in July of this year, there was a big change in Minnesota Medicaid law. It came from a decision before the Court of Appeals. Um, Department of Human Services for years had the position that in Minnesota, we could not use irrevocable, that means, you know, unchangeable trusts to give money away. So, you know, there's a five-year look back for medical assistance. Well, let's say 10 years ago, you took a bunch of money and you put it in the irrevocable trust and you give it to your kids. Or, Well, I shouldn't say 10 years. Let's say four years ago. You put in an irrevocable trust and you give it to your kids. So um, it's not your money anymore. It is irrevocable. You can't take it back. Well, they would sort of cross out the word irrevocable and say, nope, for Medicaid purposes, no such thing. Not in Minnesota. You go over the border to St. Croix River there and it works. I think it was the only state in the country that was doing this. And we felt strongly that it was um, unconstitutional. And so Michael Teeter, who's an attorney here, was at that time on medical leave, um, but he got to, he was well enough and he wrote a brief, he wrote part of a brief on this appeal uh, mm -hmm. about the constitutional 
argument. So we were really thrilled to win that because we think it's right. So it's another option. Now, we could make irrevocable trust before, but we had to plan on fighting DHS in court about it. And now, for the most part, we don't. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's no guarantees in Medicaid. But um, that was really big news. And the other big news, it was, I don't know, maybe six or seven years ago, the Gaston case in the Eighth Circuit said that we can do the Medicaid compliance annuities. And that's why those Medicaid compliant annuities I'm telling you about, they're pretty new in Minnesota. Mm-hmm. Okay. So those well, two things are game changers, total game changers. And they're not do it yourself. You can't call your financial advisor and say, can you get me one of those annuities? You really need an elder lawyer to work on it. Okay. Well, and I remember, you know, when we worked with a, an elder law with my folks, the disclosure of things could change. I'm doing the best I can, but they can change these laws and laws can go back retro to, to change too. And I was like, what, how can, I mean, <clears throat> that just really upset me going, well, how can you play a game when the rules can change at their whim and stuff? And, you know, we were lucky that kind of stuff didn't happen with us, but I, I always kind of remember that as this kind of icky cloud going, well, the state can do what the state wants to do whenever the state wants to do, <laughs> do it type thing. Yeah, to, to a point. I mean, we, it does feel like that. I agree. Um, if it, you know, we many times hold them. We, we had a client apply for, it's called Caddy. You know, the mm-hmm. programs for, we're talking about programs for over 65 today, but there's other programs for people under 65 that are similar, but they each have their own rules. So it's complicated. So we knew this couple, he was going to get a caddy waiver. And in on Medicaid, you could only have 133,000 as a couple when one was on over 65 Medicaid. The caddy waiver, the wife wasn't limited. So we took all his retirement accounts and put them in her name. I mean, you had to pay fee and everything, but we did that to protect this money. I mean, you know, she doesn't need to lose all her money. They're like 50 and applied in the county. It's up north. Nope. Nope. Denied. Nope. Nope. Can't give her that money. Can't too much money. Get it. Like, no, that's not right. We're finding all of the rules from there. Like, nope. Nope. You're wrong. We already talked to the state. You're wrong. I talked to my boss. You're wrong. You're wrong. Well, what are we going to do? Are we going to have to go to court and sue these people? And so we just tried one more time. We wrote a letter. We spelled it all out. We copied the county attorney. We're like, can you tell us how these rules don't apply to our client? The, the worker called us back and said this. Well, I was never trained on caddy waiver, and my boss wasn't either. either. <laughs> and I never read that bulletin from DHS, but when I read it, you're right. It does seem to say, I just didn't think that was right. I didn't seem right to me, but, you know, so if those people would have applied without a glory, I think they would have spent down to like a hundred thousand dollars and they would have been out like three hundred thousand dollars. And it makes me mad. Yeah. But it also makes me glad to work in a place where you know you can make a difference. So we can sometimes hold them accountable for the law. Sometimes it's not worth the attorney's fees and we tell, you know, we work with our client and decide to give in because it's not worth it. But there's other times where, yeah, they're changing the rules in the middle of the game and it's actually a lot. Yep. Well, and that is, and I think stuff like that happens more often than not. And I mean, you look Mm -hmm. at in this day and age with staff shortage, you know, not being able to be trained and, you know, people working out of their homes. So you're, you know, you're not running down the hall to ask a question or, or whatever. I I could see some of that stuff maybe increasing too, you know? Um, I don't, I feel bad for the county workers since they had to work remotely. They do not have the technology we have. We still can hardly ever email them things. I mean, it's not easy on that side. Um, But anyway, but we're here for our clients. That's the thing. And and I I made a couple of videos recently. One was don't ask the nursing home for for, um, legal advice about Mm -hmm. getting a medical system. And that's really common. That's common. And the county, people just call the county and tell them stuff and ask questions. The county gives them all this terrible advice. And it's like, oh, don't. Well, you They're have no idea who you're talking to. Huh? You know, you have no idea. It could be somebody their, their exactly. first day on the job, you know. They're not well trained. Yes. And they don't tell them. But anyway, yeah. I, I, I think that a year and a half ago, I had a case. We get, a client got denied. I thought it was completely wrong. And I got legal aid to take the case, which was great. Up on appeal because she had no money left three thousand dollars and they didn't make her and um they, they gave her a really long penalty and we won which was really glad and um anyway so we do have our victories 
And uh -huh. hopefully we're making progress and making a difference in educating, but it, it's not, it's not for lay people. It, yeah. It's to me. Sometimes you can get lucky and do it yourself and, and it goes okay. But um, boy, we see a lot more problems actually. Yeah. I have one other question that I wanted to ask you, and that is, um, especially like with dementia, you hear people go, oh, I've got to get guardianship or a conservatorship. Can you explain the difference between the two and, yeah, yeah. and how those come into play? And um, are they the answer? Yes. Okay. So we're circling back because we started mm -hmm. off talking about incapacity, those documents you need while you're still alive in case you lose capacity. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tie that to this. Normally, if you have your power of attorney for finances, you're not going to need a conservatorship. So those two match up. Conservatorship has those money similar to the attorney, in fact, under the power of attorney. Okay. So we have a healthcare directive, a good healthcare directive, and appointed good people mm -hmm. um, who are still able to serve. Then you don't need a guardian usually. Okay. The guardian is over the person, um, which is generally over healthcare kind of thing. So it's basically health and money. Now, if you don't have these documents and you know the person's not able to sign and they need, let's say they, they had an accident, they need to get in out of the hospital and discharge into rehab, someone needs to sign the contract and we have to get mm -hmm. an order from the court. Sometimes when you have the paperwork, this is like the, the people I was working with today, um, they, have, they did the paperwork, but then another family member got them to change the paperwork and there's a dispute going on. And so sometimes family's fighting or you only appointed one person, they're not available. Then you have to go to court and get the guardian conservator. The person still has capacity to understand and sign, then it's okay. But if the family's gonna fight and fight about if they have capacity, that's not gonna work either. So does that answer your question? Yeah, it really does. Uh, and again, so important to get this stuff set up ahead of time before you need it. This shouldn't be scary stuff. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of times people think, well, if I give somebody the power of attorney, I'm losing control. But that's not really true. You're still, I mean, if I have power of attorney, which I do, I'm still doing all my stuff until I need somebody to step in. Correct? Yes. And, and so same with being trustee and things, but um, so with the power of attorney, we do coach people because the one we use the most often, the statutory short -term form in Minnesota, it is effective immediately. Mm -hmm. So what most people do is they give it to the person and like, hey, if needed, then you can use it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they actually have the power, but they also have a fiduciary duty to act in your best interest and you can take it away. So there, there is, they have the power. Sometimes people, instead of giving it to them and saying, hey, save this in a secure place if something happens to me, um, some people will keep it and just mm -hmm. tell them where it is. So yep. we can coach people on what they're most comfortable with. But yeah, you mostly can um, just keep handling your own affairs. And sometimes you use it if you're out of the country for a month and you want somebody to go sign something for you too. Exactly. It feels like you're losing power. I think people are afraid of that. And there is a lot of fear to get into this and that's normal, but you actually have more options. You have more options if you plan ahead than if you wait. And yeah. if you don't need it, great. You're, I mean, you are going to die. That's true. <laughs> but <laughs> if you don't lose capacity, if you don't have to into long-term care and run out of money, that's great. But you had peace of mind and, and so did your loved ones. And the other thing I don't think people understand is that it's important to review this stuff like on an annual basis because things change. You know, um, maybe you've given power of attorney to a daughter and son-in-law and now all of a sudden they're divorced or they're estranged or, you know, you might want to change things up or a, or a baby's born or, you know, all of a sudden you've got grandchildren you didn't have or, I mean, all kinds of things, you know, divorce. Um, it amazes me how many people don't re redo their wills and all their paperwork when they get divorced. I mean, it's like that should be part of the package to me. Yes, you want to do that soon. And, um, but it's also very common. And so we're trying to overcome this because we'll have people come in and go, well, I did my will 10 years, 25 years. I can't remember the name of that attorney. He was over there. I, you know, I don't remember. They don't, they don't think about it. You get it done and you throw it on the stack and it, I did it. And yep. um, it's, we know that that's, there's a natural tendency to do that. So one of the things we do is we call them care calls. We try to call all our clients at least once a year. You know, we, we have emails that we send out newsletters just to kind of keep them aware because then they'll remember like, oh, 
so and so got divorced or new grandchild. Do I need to update my trust? Usually you don't unless, you know, I mean, a lot of times we say, don't, we got that covered for you because we cover as much as we can, you know, but, um, and then other times people have said, we've called to check in with them. They said, oh, I bought a house last year. Should I put that in my trust? Like, mm -hmm. yep, you should have. Let's do the D, you know, or, or they'll, because they remember us, they'll call and say, we're buying a house, which we do. And then we can say, just tell the title company to put this on the deed and that saves them some money. So I, we like them to review their plan with us at least every three years to like mm -hmm. talk to an attorney and just check in. But otherwise, we try to keep the communication open so you remember who we are <laughs> and think about your plan and um, keep it updated because the biggest people don't do their papers or they don't keep them updated or they don't line up their assets with their plan. And even if you have a will or a trust, it's important to make sure your beneficiaries are right and your things are titled right or your assets might pass outside your documents. So those are kind of three big mistakes. That we the other thing I hear people say is, you know, well, I just changed my will. I just added a piece of paper in and I had somebody notarize it or someone will say, well, I did a, a codicil because they, they know that that's a term, but they don't necessarily know how it's used. They, you know, my attorney gave me this to, you know, if there's certain assets I want to go, I want somebody to get the dishes and my jewelry or whatever like yeah. that. So they just add things in. Is, is that a safe route to go or should people really be reviewing the whole package? So you're asking me about, are you asking just about personal property or like a change to the will generally? I would say change the will. Maybe somebody okay. got divorced and they were yeah. going to give stuff to, to maybe stepkids yeah. that, you know, they're not going to give to anymore or whatever. So I think it well, goes both ways. I, I've heard, I've heard several scenarios on that order of people could to just kind of twist and turn and do it themselves. Yes. So it's not a good idea to do it yourself. No, <laughs> there can be huge problems, fights, probate court. No, it's not worth it. Um, call your attorney or find a new one if you, you know, and, you know, we'd be happy to help and then see if it makes sense. And like I said, sometimes you don't need a new one. And you don't need changes. If you do, and it's 20 years old, you're probably better off starting from scratch. And mm -hmm. it's probably going to be cheaper on the attorney's time to take the newest form, you know, software and customize it for you than it is to try to change some old things. Um, so a lot of times that's the case, but you can certainly do a codicil and do updates and we, we'd love you to call us. Now we've lately been getting a number of new clients because estate planning attorneys are retiring, you know, and sure. so a lot of times it, I'm just telling you that we really, it's cheaper for us and the client if we just start over. Mm -hmm. And that's unfortunate when you, I understand that's disappointing, but then we will get it all up to date and we will know all about your information. And then going forward, it's much easier and cheaper to, when you want changes, when you get sick, when you pass away, you know, all the information is here and we're well planned out for it and it's very efficient. But when you switch to a new attorney, there's a little bit of investment, you know, to get to know each other and really get things right. Which makes sense, which makes sense. Well, anything that we haven't covered, Margaret, that we should have? I have one thing I forgot to say. Mm -hmm. Thanks for asking me that, Lori. Good to tell you you're a pro at this. <laughs> um, you know, when we were talking about the nursing home, and I know, like, you got this pot of money, and all of a sudden, you're like, oh, we're paying 10000 a month. This money is going so fast. What am I going to do? And then they'll come to us, and we'll say, well, our first level asset protection plan is $3,000. And they'll be like, oh, I can't afford that. And we'll be like, wait a minute. You're paying $10,000 a month, and we're going to help you cut that way down. <laughs> We're going to have the government come in and pay like many months, years. And, and it, it, but it's a mindset because you're not educated on what we can do for you. So what the thinking is kind of like you have a pot of money. It can all go to the nursing home or the care facility or the in-home care company. It doesn't matter. Down to 3000 or 133 if you're married. Or we can start carving out pieces of that to, to, on other things that will help you that you'll pay for. I mean, that, you know, you can pay for and um, with your own money and then the government just pays more for your care and attorney's fees is part of it mm -hmm. and, and we're not i mean we have integrity you don't you want an attorney with integrity of course we're not going to recommend things that don't save you money or are likely to save you money you know um like if we did everything and then the person died the next day obviously it's not going to save as much if we knew that we would do yep. it 
But um, so we can't guarantee things, but on the whole, people get way more than they spend with us. But we understand the stresses and, um, and we understand that we're teaching you a new way of thinking about it. Yeah. Well, and I think too, uh, and again, I'll go from my own personal experience, you know, my mom was on medical assistance and I remember having to meet with them and that's such an intimidating process, that five-year look back. And I remember going down there, I had a little two-wheeler with like two rainbow boxes full of like three ring notebooks where all of their stuff. And, um, but I was prepared because my attorney prepared me for what all I needed. So I had it all organized and and um, the person reviewing things goes, I, I've, I've never had anybody bring everything I need. The only thing I was missing was my dad's VA discharge paper or something. She's like, that's a no brainer. But she's like, you have everything here really easy. And just knowing that I did it right, because I mean, my God, if I had to go back, I, I would just be in a panic mode if, if it wasn't right. And from yeah. the sounds of it, that's what most people go through. But just having that guidance was so helpful. Right. Or, or they're not prepared. They don't have the documents or even worse. They give documents they didn't need to give. And then they, they look bad, even though they're honest people. And then they ask them for a bunch of like, oh, give me your last five years of checkbook now. And it's mm-hmm. just like, oh, my word. So now that's digital, Lori. Mm-hmm. You know, things are digital. So clients give us stuff. We scan them and we give them to the county. We work with them. So you don't actually have to go meet with them face to face anymore. <laughs> but That is exactly what we do. We get our ducks in a row and we present them. Exhibit A is this, exhibit B is that. Here's what you asked for. The client's still working on this. That's going to come in as soon as it can. It makes it very easy for them to approve. And Mm -hmm. and it makes them not go digging. Because like you said, our clients, they're honest people, but they maybe they didn't know about the gifting rule or they, um, mom just gave daughter 500 a month for everything she was doing and there wasn't a contract and there's not receipts and all the things that Medicaid wants. So we just don't necessarily want them to go digging in that, you know? Yep. And so um, if you present it well, like you did, and it saves them time, it makes their job easier, so much better for you. Yep. Yep. But again, having that counsel, talking to someone who knows the ropes inside and out and that you're hiring to protect you. Uh, to me, that is a just a really, really important factor. Yeah, so. we, there's no, there's no comparison. We, we had a client recently, the nursing home said, just spend on all your money. And then we have 3,000, we'll apply for you. You don't have to pay an attorney, you know, people. And so they applied, but the life estate was all screwed up on the house. Mm-hmm. And they got denied. And then they came to us in a panic. Well, mom only had 3,000 left. The kids had to pitch in the money to hire us. But we helped them. We fixed it. I mean, and, and the facility referred them to us. They knew we could fix it. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's you just never know. It's good to have a lawyer look at it and tell you what you need to send and what you don't need to send. And that's going to be a problem. Let's fix it the best we can before, before we send it in. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, I want to give people your contact information. So for those of you that like to talk on the phone, you can uh, give them a holler at 612-615-9535. Uh, um, or their website, uh, you can go to safeharborestatelaw.com and email is info at safeharborestatelaw.com. And the company is located at 3240 Rice Street in St. Paul, Minnesota, 55126. Thank you so much, Margaret, for the time and your wealth of information that you gave us today. Hopefully this will make people feel a little bit more comfortable in terms of just even the terms and what do they need and when should they get it. And don't forget about, you know, starting your kids off right when they graduate, buy them a package uh, so that they can get things in order. So it's not so scary. Yeah. Uh, we serve all ages. Yeah. <laughs> not just 18 yeah. year olds and seniors, but yeah, everybody needs it. So we cover the gamut. Exactly. Thank and don't forget so much. Yeah. And don't forget to review this every year, every, like you said, three years at, at minimum, because life changes, life goes on. And a lot of times we think we have that taken care of. And then all of a sudden you open it up and go, Oh, I didn't really, I, I said that, or I, I told this person was going to get that. And all of a sudden this person is not even maybe in your life anymore. It's very easy to forget. Yep. People will say that's a joint account. And they'll say, well, let's look at it. Oh, it's not joint. It, it's very common. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Totally okay. Wonderful. Well, thank you again so much for your time. I appreciate your expertise. 
Thank you. Bye-bye. So again, like, click, and share. Don't keep this uh, information secret. Pass it on. We'll catch you next time. Bye-bye. It's time to rethink, renew, and reimagine retirement. Hey, everybody. Jared Sebesta here, host of Retire Repurposed. Now, this podcast is about the non-financial parts of retirement, which many times can be even more challenging than the financial. We believe retirement is not the end, rather the beginning of what could be the most impactful, purposeful, and fulfilling season of a person's life. So don't retire. Become repurposed. To listen now, search Retire Repurposed on your favorite podcast platform, Senior Resource, or Life Audio.